Hello, everyone, and welcome to Courageous Conversations. I am Nakia Salmon, and Courageous Conversations is different. It's different from Catch Up because it has nothing to do with mining schools, and it's different for specific reasons. The first thing, I'm pulling in guests who are comfortable to speak with me live, and not everyone is. The second thing is I want you guys to see, to learn from, and to hear from people who are living boldly and dare to pursue their best life and live out their dreams. That is the intent of Courageous Conversations. We want to learn all the nuances of what they're learning, how they're doing it, so we can see what is possible. And my first guest is Dr. Andrew B. Campbell, otherwise known as Dr. ABC. And I'm excited about this session. For anyone of you who know him, his energy is amazing, life-giving, like a breath of fresh air. So I want you to grab your favorite drink because we have ours. Andrew, what are you drinking? I'm having some, um, so, um, where's they? It's good, good. good. All right. And I am going to tell you a little bit more about Dr. Andrew B. Campbell. He is a graduate of the University of Toronto with a PhD in Educational Leadership, Policy and Diversity. He is presently a faculty member in the Master of Teacher program at the University of Toronto and an adjunct assistant professor at Queen's University Online. He is an Ontario certified teacher and has been an educator for over 25 years in Jamaica, the Bahamas, and Canada. He has authored two books. The first one is Teachable Moments with Dr. ABC, A Spoonful for the Journey, that he published in 2015. And the second book is The Invisible Student in the Jamaican Classroom, published in 2018. His research and teachings focus on issues of equity, diversity, inclusion, leadership, LGBTQ issues, and teacher performance evaluation. He has presented at numerous peer-reviewed academic conferences and has delivered many presentations as a motivational speaker, keynote, and workshop facilitator. He loves people. He loves food and honey, he loves fashion and traveling. Look at him. <laughs> you look fantastic, Andrew. Thank you. I'm, <laughs> serving, I'm, I'm serving you from my Wakanda roots. I really like Wakanda roots. So I'm serving you from my Wakanda roots this evening. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate it, as you can see. Look behind me. Nakia, that's the only time I think I've ever appeared in a movie with my name and it's in Black Panther. So my goodness, when I heard it, I screamed I out. Go ahead. And we had no idea we was going to see that, right? So it's a line. No idea. It's a line. It's a line. I said to my husband, honey, I think we need a divorce. You know, there comes a time in life when a girl has to make tough choices and Black Panther needs it. <laughs> so, you know, Andrew... You have had, um, every week, you have different um, shows that you will read about, even from your book. And we're going to talk a little bit about your book today. Yes. And I don't know if people fully understand your journey, right? And most of the time, too, when you're speaking, you're feeding and edifying others, right? Trying to figure out what do they need to hear in the moment. You constantly say, I don't know who this is for, right? Yes. And you just yes. go with the flow. But what I want you to do is to be intentional to give us a peek into yeah. who you are and your heart and the intentional logical processes that you take to be who you are today. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're, we're going to start from the beginning. We're going to start yes. your childhood. So tell us about your childhood, where you grew up, your family, your location of birth, um, your location where you were born, your birth order. Just let us get to know your origins. Well, I grew up in Waterford, Portmore, St. Catherine in Waterford. And I always, I, I used to like to say, um, the footprints in the, in the streets and the sidewalk in Waterford, they belong to us. So we went, we grew up there when there was no streets, there were no road, it was just new, new community. So I grew up in Waterford and I am the smallest, I'm the baby of my family. Do you act like the baby? The wash belly, but I'm not... You see, people love to say the wash belly is spoiled. I am, I am so not the stereotypical wash belly. Because the truth is, I was left alone a lot. 
Yeah. I, mean, I was left alone a lot. I had to grow up fast. And I remember, you know, at six, I remember being six, going to school in grade one. I was responsible for brushing my teeth, eating my breakfast, bathing, put on my clothes, lock the door and give the key to my neighbor and then walk to school at six. That was a whole process. And so, yeah, that's it for my family. I grew up with a brother, a sister in the, on the home. And then I had a, my, my, my dad had a, um, um, a daughter first, which my big sister, my mother had a son first, my big brother. And then we, we, they came together, the four of us. So I grew up with my brother and my sister as well. So growing up, what words would you use to describe yourself as a teenager or as a young adult? As a teenager. Hmm. My word as a teenager, I was always ambitious and a dreamer. So I would say an ambitious dreamer or a dreamer and being ambitious. I was always a go-getter. I always wanted more. I grew up without a lot of stuff, but I got a glimpse of what more looked like. And it's funny because more for me was we grew up with, I don't know if you remember, we grew up in the soap opera era when everybody was watching soap opera. So Generations and watch. Dallas and Generation, which one? Dallas, but my favorite was, was Dynasty and Falcon Crest. And you grow up seeing what persons who have things, what it looked like. And so you grow up dreaming and, and, and being ambitious. I wanted that. I wanted what I saw in Dynasty and Falcon Quest and TV. And you realize it was more than just things. It was a lifestyle. And I wanted that. So for me, ambitious, a dreamer. Um, those are my, those are my words. I'm, I'm, a, I'm very big on dreams and following your dreams. Very big on dreams. So even in your book, in terms of teachable moments, you describe where you lived and the view you had and the people that you saw and the life that they lived. Tell us more about that. Even yeah, yeah, yeah. Because in where I was in, 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 in Waterford, you could see the hills and you could see the big houses. You could see far and you knew, even when you get to go in town, I went to Kingston College and you'd know that there were people that lived on a hill. You know, there were students in your school that their parents came for them and they drove back up in the hills in Cherry Gardens and Beverly Hills and those kind of places. And I never went up on the hill. So for me, people on the hill meant they attained certain things. They, 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 they had certain things. And so I was always ambitious about one day living on the hill, you know, and the hill is more than just the physical hill. Of course, it's, it's a metaphor for having, having more than enough. Because I feel like the people who lived on the hill, they had, they, had much, they, had, they had enough to spare. They had more than enough. For us who lived, you know, in Waterford, on the valley, on the flat, you know, those who lived on, you know, we talk about dump up land because, you know, Portmore was built on dump up land. So we literally lived on the spaces that people had to create for us. We live on the flat. You, most of us, we had just enough or yeah. most of us, we had less than enough. I grew up with less than enough. I grew up with less than enough. And, and, and so I've always dreamt and I've always wanted enough. And then later on, I realized it was okay to have more than, more enough. than enough. Because growing up in, and at this I want to share, growing up in church taught you some of the best. And I must say this, I, I, I will never let go some of the things I learned growing up in church. And, but some of the things you learned growing up in church, you also realize you want it to yourself if that was the right thing. For instance, how we define humility. I have, a, I have a major issue with how, as a child, we were taught to be humble. And humble for us meant you was always satisfied with what you have and you didn't, and you shouldn't ask some more. So that was humility, not asking for more. And the more I grow old, I realize you can ask some more. It's okay, it's not, it's okay to ask some more. And so, yeah, those words were ambitious. And, and, and the all I grew, the all I got, the more my, I wanted more and the more I dreamt. And more was never, more was, ne let me just say this, for those who are listening, more is not about money. More is not about money. I want more love. I want more family. I want more moments. I want more peace. You know, I, I, when, I when I pray, 
Sometimes I want more pride. I, I wish I could stay longer. I want to sleep. I go to my bed. And I wish I could be on my knees even more. It's about, it's about having so much you can share, having so much you can give. Because I think we, we thought that giving away what you had was humility and it was kindness. But so many times we give away what we had and we lacked. And we, sometimes we regret that we gave it away because we could use it. So, yeah. So for me, I want more. I want more. So I think I've even heard you say it in terms of people should get from our overflow. Yeah. We should empty out ourselves for other people. They should yeah. get from our abundance and overflow when you are already full. Right? Yeah. 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 And it's not selfish. Because a lot of time when people say it, there are people who say it in a genuine selfish way, like, I'm only going to give you if I have it overflow. And overflow, you have to be careful of that because even yeah. overflow can be, I'm only giving you because I don't want it. I'm giving you because it's going to waste anyhow. That's not right. what overflow means. It means you're full. And full don't necessarily, let me give you an example. Full Go ahead. It's overflowing. This glass for me, this is a full drink. That just came to me. This is a, thank you. This is a full drink. I poured this, I poured this amount. And this amount for me is satisfying. Yeah. If it, if this overflow right now, I yeah. would be drunk or I'd either just be a mess. So not every time full means overflow means it's literally running over. Right. It had enough. There and you go. Someone come and have some also. So that's what it means. It doesn't mean waste. Another thing that you said in your book is satisfied. Listen, man, you know, I'm going to always go back to it <laughs> and what it means to be satisfied. The next thing we're going to talk about is transformation, mm -hmm. internal transformation. So share one major significant <sighs> internal change or transformation you experienced that is integral to who you are now. Share the experience or the, or the event that was the catalyst for this transformation. The catalyst for me, I, I clearly remember, it's starting to work at 16 plus. Yes. So I graduate, yeah, I see, people don't know that. See, people don't know that. I graduate yeah. Kinsan College at 16. And all my friends were going to sixth form. And, sorry, I want to go to sixth form like everybody has put on your white shirt. You know, sixth form is white shirt, right? And I just couldn't, my, my parents was like, my mom was like, you know, my sister left school in fifth form and she started working. My brother left school in fifth form. He started working. And so I follow the pattern. So it's not just myself, my bigger sister um, and my brother, they all left school in fifth form and we started working. None of us went to sixth form. And so at that time I was 16 plus, I was still 16. And I started legally working a check from the Ministry of Education. So it's not illegal, legally at I could be an, a clerical assistant. And so when I realized that I was now on my own, I was now responsible for my future. My mom, you know, had brought me and my dad, my parents had brought us so far. And so far meant sixth form. Sorry, so far meant high school. Sexy. Sexy is like the all in all. You yep. know, time. For many people now, they bring them to university and they graduate and that's when, you know, they, they, they're like the, on your own. For me, for many of us, not just myself, for many of us in Jamaica, finishing high school, getting your four or five or six CXC, that was your ticket to say, go, go find life. Go find life. So I owned that at 16 plus. I realized I am now in charge of my destiny. And I was excited that I was going to make my own decision. So that was a catalyst for me of transformation. I started making my own decisions. And with those decisions, I also started making my own, owning my own consequences. Because a lot of us, a lot of us don't realize for every decision is a consequence. And so I started owning my consequences as well as my decisions. So that was my big transformation, starting to work at 16 and starting to focus on where do I wanna be? And I was still dreaming. At 16, I was the clerical assistant at Waterford Primary School. At Waterford Primary School, I was a clerical assistant and I was in a room in a school filled with teachers. 
And my first level dream, I wanted to be a teacher. And so I was in a school as a clerical assistant, collecting the attendance, doing whatever. Mm -hmm. And I saw visions around me of what I could be. Uh, Every time I saw the teachers come in, Miss, Miss, Miss Huzzy, Mr. Lewis, and Miss John Keaton, you know, I see the teachers, I see Miss Myers, I see them. I want to be one of them. Yes. I want to. So that fueled me. That fueled me. What called you different in the teaching field that was different from even the performing arts and different from other things? Because you were involved in other things too. Yes. I always different? want to be a teacher. I yeah. always want to be a teacher. I know some people may not like when I say this, but I always want to be in charge. <laughs> I believe teachers are in charge. I mean, things are, things are changing now. Yeah. It's cool to see that the kids run the school. But I've always known that teacher was in charge. Te you have to listen to what teacher said. And so I love that kind of authority. And I always wanted to be in charge. And so I also want to be a teacher though, but I've been, I've, I've been, I've been one of those little boys who have been teaching the furniture and teach all the neighbors. So that's Are you beat the bush? You beat the bush though? Beat the bush, beat everybody. <laughs> everybody get beaten. Everybody. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, the reason I, you know, I asked about this transformation question because it's important for us to go through those different phases and different seasons and mm -hmm. about it. And when I was reading your book, um, there was a fight between which spoonful I liked. And it was either the place value one or the caterpillar and canker worms because it stepped on something for me that was personal. So mm -hmm. the one that won was the one around place value. I mean, Natalie's on. I have been paying at Yes, Nats is on. Hey, Nats, because I've been so intently looking at you. I can see who is in the chat. Natalie will know why this one is Nakia, right? So it's place value number 19. Here is the reading from his book. And the book is, just to make sure, because not everybody knows, Teachable Moments with Dr. ABC, A Spoonful for the Journey, published in 2015. So he said, this week, I'm taking my students back through place value. Place value is a topic I used to teach every September. It is the base of many math topics. By the way, I was a high school math and science teacher in Jamaica, I went to teacher's college as well. You cannot really build on higher order concepts unless you truly understand the place value. Simply, place value states that every number has a place and every number has a value. If you move a number to another place, it changes its value. For example, in this number 500, the digit five means 500s. In this number 105, the digit five means five ones. Five ones is a long way off from 500. We agree? Yeah. Yes, there are both fives, but based on their place, they have clearly a different value. What place are you sitting in? Yeah, the Pamican Andrew. What place have you decided to stay in? Are you planning on moving from that place? Do you want to increase your value? Are you happy being in the ones column? Do you know that you can move from the ones column to the hundreds and even to the millions? Just think if that same five was here at five million. Wow, what a value, what a place to be. I always smile when I hear others say we are all the same. I always smile when others say we are all the same. I repeat, I always smile when I hear others say we are all the same. We are not all the We're same. Not. Not. And I am sure I do not have to honestly show you the differences there are between yourself and many, many others. What will you do today to change your place? What will you do today to change your value? Let us continue to work hard at moving our place and we will surely see a change in our value. Drop the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank right? you. Right? So let me tell you, we have goosebumps. I, you know, it's like, um, it's personal for the people who know me. And if you know me and know my journey, you'll know mm -hmm. why this connects with me. Because the early years of my life, I, was, I lived in Greater Portmore. 
I have many seasons, Andrew, that's another day. But for many seasons of my life, I was a five in the ones column for many yeah. years. And it took a lot of inner work to even think I could move to the tens and hundreds. Now I'm working. And how could I even get to the millions and the billions? Absolutely. But Absolutely. we're not all the same. No. It's no. not true. I want to say, true. guys, I'm not a reader, by the way. Natalie's going to laugh. So when I tell you to get your audio book, it's for selfish reasons. I'm an audio girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm an audio girl. But I what, remember I, that. Yeah, what I love about Spoonful is that it's small morsels, right size bites for daily inner journey. It's a great guide. And if it's you alone, it's great. And if it's a group, it's even better. Mm-hmm. Right? So yeah. I just want to say that. And, I, and people know me, know that I don't like to. So when I say this is a good, good, good book, I do mean it. And I okay. really encourage you guys to go get it. Thank Sorry, you. I had to go on my soapbox for a minute. Let's talk <laughs> about execution. Execution yeah. is my secret sauce. Share a goal that seemed intimidating, impossible at first that you achieved. What do you believe were the key factors to you achieving that goal? So the goal is funny. The goal is I'm going to share is, is the book, writing a book, writing my first book. And why I want to share that, because I want the persons who are listening to understand. I talk about dream a lot. I talk about ambition. I talk about passion a lot. But none of this is going to be possible unless you put the work in. You talk about your place and the value and want to move from the ones line to the hundred lines to the million line. That is about work. That is about being intentional about work. And when I say, you know, hard work, I don't mean you have to build, you know, labor, labor, labor. I'm talking about being smart about your choices. So for me, it was a book. And it was a, it was a, it was a consistency and the discipline that I had to put in. So let me give, tell you, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if you know, when I started writing the book, I used to post, well, I post every single word power every one of those they are online from six about seven years ago so if you go on my teachable moment page seven years back you will find the first one every single one in that book is it was was posted online so what happened was that you start something a lot of us we are good at starting things i'm sure you know that a lot of us are good i have seen people who start something every day What we are not good at is continuing. What we are not good at is my, one of my word is stamina. And that is why sometimes when people look at me and they try to, you know, people try to compete, I go to them. I said, honey, let me tell you something. I have what many of you don't have, and that is stamina. I will stick to something until I get it done. I am one of those persons who will scrub and scrub till you scrub it out, right? It's about stamina. So writing that book, after you write five, five posts, um, posts and you read 50 and you read 20, you read 30, it takes certain effort. And so for me, that's the whole idea of the discipline that goes into people getting where they want to go in every single thing in my studies. You know, I tell people why I have been to school like you where I go, I can't do this course. But every time I said, I'm, I can't do this course and I'm going to stop school, Immediately, I look up to the dream, to the house on the hill, and I realize there's no way I'm going to get there if I drop out of school. No way. I, I, t- I tell you this. There's one of the teachable moments in that book where I wrote about, I realized education was going to be my way out. And I'm going to be frank with you. I thought about other ways, other ways out. If you remember, when, I, when we were maybe 16, 17, that was when drugs was big in Jamaica. Everybody has sell drugs, I push drugs. People are, people are drug mule. You're like, that was, that was drug time when drug was a sell. And people are making money from drugs. Are you no druggist? Right? I realized I couldn't sell no drugs. You can't survive prison. <laughs> jail. I can't go to jail. And then I, I can't be no paid gunman. And I say this because I have a, I, I won't tell a story today, but I, I know people paid gunman. So there's a real thing about paid gunman in politics in Jamaica. 
Yeah, okay. man. So I couldn't get into that because that's not me. And I figure out that education was going to be the key. And I used to listen to profile, Ian Boyne profile. And I was always inspired by Ian Boyne profile. I realized education could be a way out. Yeah. It's not the only way out. And let me say this because a lot of people like to, you know, to think that education is not the only way out. There are people who can be successful without education, but it was my way out. I figured that was going to be my way out. And so for me, that transformation, that consistency, writing that book, getting to a place where you understand what you're going to do, how you're going to get there, and you have to be putting the work. You have to put in the work. A lot of us want to do things, but we don't want to put in the work. You have to put in the work. You know, the hardest part, Andrew, is in the middle. In yeah. the middle oh, yeah. is uncomfortable. In the middle, jeez, in the middle, because it's can turn. Yeah, go ahead. You're, you're not sure. In the middle, yes. you're not sure how it's going to end. And that anxiety is killing. But, but you are either too afraid to go back. You're either too ashamed to go back. <laughs> or, let me tell you something. This is that thing about being afraid and ashamed of what people are going to say. Yeah, man. If you use that the right way, it can. Powerful. I had something I said. It's not my original thought. I've heard this back in church. Yes. This is the doubters. That kind of thing that if I fail, and so you, you, you know that you, don't, you can't afford to fail. Not because of people, but because of where you want to go. You have that idea of the hill again. You have the ambitions. You know that if I give up, I will not be getting that. So just as cheap you go. Yeah. Just as cheap you go. Might as well you go. Because sometimes the hall looks really dark. dark. You look dark and you say, look here, it really looks uncertain. You don't know if you're going to step on crocodile. You don't know what is going on. You have to jump time in the middle, man. The light, in you the can't middle. really see the light yet. You can't nope. really see anything yet. And sometimes I tell people, I feel like I'm walking with a matchy stick. Forget candle. You yep. know, matchy stick, you have to strike it again. And then mm -hmm. it burns your finger. Yep. You have to strike it again. I said, some seasons in my life feel like I'm walking with a matchy stick where I don't even can barely see the next best step. And I have to just have faith that yeah. I know that where I am now is just unacceptable. Yeah. And the fear of staying where I am and the fear of moving forward, I have to measure them and just keep moving forward. That the one yeah. to go back, greater. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about dreams a little bit. Ah, <laughs> Right? Because people look at what you. What we want to talk about dreams. What we yes, want to talk about they look dreams. at you and they said, look at you, man. By the way, so if it was a gunman, you would be a hot gunman. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I would still kill. Don't worry. I would still kill. I just want to make sure. I know Natalie would be proud of that statement. We'd be like, look, if you can't stick me up, you can't take anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I digress. Um, so, we talk about, so let's talk about dreams, right? Because you mm. look like you are doing everything that you want right you look like you know people say i guess you have reached but i want to ask you what excites you that you wish you were doing that you are not doing now i have a lot of dreams <laughs> i have a lot of dreams and it's not that i'm greedy i um i just said what are you wish you could do that you're not doing now mm -hmm. it's dreams um I won't get into the, the academic and the ambition one because the, I'm getting there and I'm working and, I, and I'm living my best life. I'm truly living. And you know what? Let me say before I, before I get, before I answer that about what is it that I would have loved to do that I'm not doing now. Yeah. I am living my dream. You know, we grew up in this place where people don't believe dreams come true. I'm living my dream. The things I dreamt about, I'm living. Them. I think the problem with some people is that your dreams are, are pretentious and they're fake. I just want to say this for a minute. A lot of people, their dreams are fairy tale. A fairy tale is different from a dream. You know, you know, you ask somebody, what is that you want? You want the biggest house in the world. Like, really? What do you want to do with the biggest house in the world? What the hell do you want to do with the biggest house in the world? You, that's not a dream. That's just ridiculous. But you dream that you want a house with four bedroom and this and that, and with a pool and a this. That's a good dream that you can work towards. So some of the things that I'm doing, a lot of what I'm doing now, I dream it. I'm, listen, I am working from my home office. Yeah. People on the hill is the one that usually use it. You're in your home office. And dynasty. People yes. are in offices. Like, I'm 
living a dream. I literally have a room in my house that is my office. I don't sleep in here. This is not a bedroom. This is my home office. And that's a dream. But let me get to your question, because I know you want your question answered. What is it that I'm doing now? I'm going to tell you what is it. Tell me. I, I want more when it comes to a committed relationship. All right. I want more. And I don't necessarily want what I see in the magazine, you know, the, the, the cute look of what it is. I have tasted and I've enjoyed and I've experienced love more than once. I know what, I know what it is to have somebody just want you and desire you. And I know it is to be happy and just happy with someone. And I want that all the time. I don't know, you know, the other day I was thinking that a lot. It was on my Facebook, you know, on my one of my spoonful. I remember clearly I was in the park across there. I was in the park one Saturday morning. It's one of those videos. And I asked the question, can we have it all? Because what I what I do is though I dream and I want more, what I never do not care is stay in a place of constant yearning and not enjoy the present. Mm -hmm. So if I say to you, you know, having my own home, this is the best place I have lived, I would, that would be, that would be true because it's my own home. Yeah. But I could tell you, I've lived in many, many beautiful spaces. And when I was in those spaces, I enjoyed them. I am not a regular classroom teacher anymore, but I can tell you, Every single classroom from the Bahamas to Jamaica, grade five, reading lab, reading room. I lived. I enjoyed those. So what am I saying that? I'm saying having a desire to want more doesn't say what you have is always not good enough. Right. More is great. More is good. So for me, that dream is I want that storybook love. I want, I want more of that. I want to have, I want to, I want to have love every day. I want to be talking to you right now. And when I look across to my living room, my, my partner is, is looking over there or he's passing or he's listening or something. I want that. I want that. I want that fullness of, because you know what? I'm going to tell you this and I'm going very personal. Yeah. I am aware not new. I have always been aware that you should, in, I've said this a lot, in all you're getting, make sure you have people. And I have people. Oh, I am blessed. I have people. But I also want that special person that when I'm old and dry up, I'm not cute anymore and I can't beat the face anymore and I'm not walking the room and people thinking, oh my God, I love. When all of this, when all of this, I want to be when I'm all I drop, I don't have enough juice inside of me. Somebody loves me because they love me, love me, love me. They love my loud mouth because after all I get, my mouth is going to be louder. Somebody's, I think there's somebody wanting my voice to be a little bit lower. The all I get, I'm going to have a louder mouth, I think. Right? And I'm just going to be even more me. I want, I want that partner that wants just me, just as me. Because I'm telling you something, I've been, I've had quite, I've had, I've had my good share of attention. You know, I'm going to say this for those out there, you know, I, I'm saying this. I could have been married maybe three or four times if I, if, if I had followed offers out there. I could have been married three or four times. So I'm not, I just, I'm a little bit more intentional about certain things. And I believe if I'm going to do that, I need certain things. So no, so no, I'm not. I, I could have been, but I, so I want that. I want more. I want that fullness. So I want, but the next time I fall in love or if I'm in love, I want it to be forever. You know what I'm saying? It's, yes. it's not like fantasy, but it can happen. I know it can happen. It I've can. seen beautiful people in great relationships and I covet that. I covet good gifts. So that is my dream of what I want next. I want somebody to share all my time with. That I'm is, right. it is possible, Andrew. It's gonna happen. Amen. 
amen so shall it be and please help your little host here you can't talk any and anything when i'm having a drink you will go into the wrong hole and i will choke on facebook <laughs> you understand <laughs> I'm gonna be careful. I'm gonna be careful. When you see draw the glass, just no says we can't make sure you here. I'm never trying to look cute. Let's talk about beliefs. Mm -hmm. Right, and beliefs is I'm asking this question about beliefs in a different way. What okay. do you know? What do you know for sure or feel very strongly about that others might disagree with you about? Ah, so I'm going to share with you two things. Mm. And it's weird that I'm going to share this right after my dream. So maybe this is a dream problem. You know what? None of us is perfect. Maybe this is my dream problem. Are you going to contradict yourself now? Maybe on Facebook. Maybe on Facebook tonight. I officially contradict myself. Let's see. But I'm going to be honest. What do you get from me? So one of the things I believe in, he said, you know, beliefs that are strong. So there are a couple of things I want to share. The first one is this. I do not believe in suffering to be with anyone. Mm. So, yes. Coming from my dream question, right? Yes. And I've had people crit critique me or criticize me with, when it comes to certain things. I do not believe in suffering to be with anyone. Mm -mm. I believe love, and I, I, I'm not a love expert, duh, duh, you know, whatever. But I also believe, the way I see some people fight to be in love, fight to be in love. Yeah, I don't believe in it. I believe love should supposed to be a little bit easier. So I know maybe people must be commenting and telling, saying, Yeah, man, comment if you agree. Saying, but... <laughs> I just don't, I'm going to tell you, like, for instance, I see people who are in abusive relationship and mm -hmm. they're like, you know, but now we're happy because their family stopped getting the beating or something like, no, no, like I have, I, I genuinely, and I, you know what? And I know people would be like, I know what is to compromise, but compromise, Erta Kit, Erta Kit said compromise for what? You know, I believe in compromising, but compromise for what? It must be worth compromise. Mm. The compromise, it must be, it, the compromise, it must work me to compromise. Mm. And, and I see a lot of people want to get in people's lives and they, they it's, it's like a work to be in love. I don't want to go into that kind of deepness. I want to be in love, but I don't think love's supposed to be that kind of heavy lifting. If you love me enough, there's supposed to be so much effort on both of us. I'm not saying... I, you know, I don't believe in putting in the work, but I have seen people, I've seen people fight every day to be in love, like fight. No, I'm sorry. So sorry, sorry persons out there who may love me and you, but you put in 20 years of work. Oh, that's too much. That's too much. <laughs> the first that's the first thing. That's believe. the first. That's the first the belief. The second one is something I'm, I very, I'm strong. I'm very strong in because of my experiences. Mm. I believe family is way more than blood. Ah. And um, I'm very strong about this, and this is something that people may know about. Will go know about me. I am a very jolly person, and I have amazing friends. But I have, I have quite a bit, and I'm using this on your program live. I have a number of family members who don't care for me. And we don't talk. And I'm going to be frank with you. I am fine. I am 100% fine. Because what I'm, I come back to the same law. What I'm not going to do is to fight you to love me. So because of my sexual orientation, we, go to, we have to go there. Mm -hmm. um, and Jamaica, you know, whatever, whatever. Of course, I'm going to go to L, Jesus strike me, blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, I have had family members who don't talk to me. My brother, I grew up very, very close to. Who we, we, I have a, I, we grew up in the same house, in the same room until I was 21. I moved out. We were good brothers. We never fight and good. And all of a sudden, you know, because of religion and his wife, they decide I am not the right 
uncle, maybe I'm not the right brother, and that's fine. I've let them go. And, I, and, and I've tried to work it out. And when I realize it's not going to work out, then I left it. I let it go. So no, I don't send post. I send postcards to tons of people. I don't send postcards to them. I give people tons of gifts. I don't give them gifts. And I have brother like that. I have a niece like that. I have, I have family members like that. I have nephews like that. I, I don't care. Because, because let, me let me say this, and I know I'm going to go a little bit strong with this. We, a lot of us, we don't know how to love ourselves. And a lot of us, we love many people than we love ourselves. There is no win in loving people than yourself. I know I have good loving to give. And that is friendship love and sexual love and all kind of love. I have, you know why I have good loving to give? Because I, I know what it is to love myself. And the love I'm going to give to you, Nakia, as my friend, is the love I have for myself. My friends can tell you, I treat my friends with respect, but I treat them with the love I respect myself with. I treat my family with respect, but you are not going to get way more from me than you give to me. I believe in reci 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 reciprocity. I believe in reciprocity. And it doesn't mean if I give you, a, if you give me a glass of wine, I'm going to give you back a glass of wine. If I give you a glass of wine, you may give me a, you may give me a, a Sharpie. Yeah. It's the same value. It's the same value. You need a glass of wine. I need a Sharpie. But it can't be that every time you come, you get a glass of wine. And I never even get nothing from you. I, 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 and people think it's cute. And people think it's humility. No, these are the same people. After a while, you hear them crying and said they wasted their time with you or they have been living a life, a life of robbery. I'm not doing that. And I'm, let me just say, I'm not, you know, it's a talk show where I'm on a, a, a talk show and I know I've already, I, 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 I know you're going to go for place with this. I will not be one of those persons, Nakia, who at 60 years will come on your couch crying that somebody didn't love me when I was 10. Excuse me? <laughs> Excuse me? And I know there are therapists out there maybe talking up, you know, saying, Andrew, I disagree. People need healing. Well, I'm got, I've been working on my own healing. Yeah from a place where I heard because of my sexuality that I was demon possessed. I heard that in church. I heard that, you know, you are the worst. You are nothing. I heard all of that. And I've come from that kind of, that kind of conversation to right now. I love me so much. I think somebody going to arrest me one day for self-love. I am not pretentious about my love for myself. I love me, but I've worked on loving me. Because I came from a place where I was taught not to love me. I was taught that you are this, you are a mess, you are this, you are this. You know, I, growing up, I was Sissy Boo. I was all the things that you could call the nicknames, right? And so you grew up in that space. So I'm at a place where I love me. And I choose, and, and say this, I choose me over everyone, Nakia. I choose me over you. I choose me over you. If I say to you, Nakia, I love you more than I love myself, that's a lie. And I don't want nobody to love me more than they love themselves because that's dangerous. I don't want that foolishness. The only person I give that power to is a mother. And that's you, to love your children more than you love yourself. Nobody else I give that, I give that authority to. I don't believe in it. So for me, that's, a, that's the next one. You know, the idea, because people have done, I see people suffering, Nakia. I know I'm taking up time with this one. No! Honey, let it flow. Yep. I see people suffering in the name of blood. But she's my sister. She's my mom. I have seen, I have seen parents abuse peep, their kids, like adult kids, like everything come out of their mouth is so wrong. And I go, you have to, you have to, you have to make your mother talk to you less. But <laughs> I said, you can, I, I will never be on the phone. Never be on the phone with anybody who is berating me that much. When my mother and my mom call me and my mom says certain things, I remember I love my mom so much. And she was going through, and I gave her time to go through stuff. And she would say to me, church people, church people, I said to her, mommy, I'm gonna, you're going to have to stop calling me. Don't call me back if you're going to tell me about church people because church people don't care about me. Church people do not care about me as you think they do. They don't. They don't. They're looking for you to be, to be, all battered and bruised and dead, so they could lay hands and say they pray for you. Why we can't lay hands and say Jesus bless him more? Why is it that we always want to lay hands all when people are ripped and part and damaged, and when they are, and we don't pray for them to live their best life? Some of us we like to go in like we like to go in for emergency surgery. Let me 
go in and show him love because he is battered and bruised and he's destroyed. But you do not show that person love. Well, let me just say this because I feel it and I need to say this. There are people right now, and I, I'm speaking out of my spirit, who I know are not cheering me on. They see me and they're supposed to cheer me on. They're not cheering me on. But you know what they want to do? They're the same people who want to hear tomorrow morning, I am dying. I am something as bad as happened to me. And they want to show up to come pray for me. You better keep your prize, honey. Keep that prior because I want you to pray for me now that the Lord bless me. I'm a, Christ, I'm a spiritual person, so I go, I go to Jesus all the time. That's what I do. But I see it happen a lot. So even that blood, let's transfer into the, the church blood. You know, and, I, and, and it happens a lot. We, we, there's something about us, Nakia, that likes to see people not doing well enough for us to feel like we are supporting them. We don't want to cheer them on. You know, something you said, Nakia, I don't know how much you have said it. And I don't know if I have permission, but I feel like I have permission to say this. You always, you have said more than once about a private jet, and I feel it in my spirit. I'm going to tell you, this. I'm saying it to you, Nakia. I was laughing today while I was getting ready. And I laughed to myself and I said, when Nakia busts big, I hope you know I want a, a flight on our jet. That's what I said. That's what I said. Something said to me, I want a ride on your jet. Why is it that I do? I, that's what I want. I want a ride on your jet. I want you to remember that I, want, I was on your program and you give me a ride. But, not, but many people don't do that. You know what they do? They think, she have a jet. Well, she want a jet for? She'll never get a jet. But we will praise every single movie star, every mm -hmm. single people who don't know who they are, and we pick them up. Oh, did you see Rihanna new jet? Did you see Beyonce jet? Did you see that person jet? Did you see that person jet? Did you see Tyler Perry? And the people beside you who you love and care for, you do not speak jet in their life. I speak jet in your life, girl. I receive it. Life. Natalie, I no. Jet in your life. Natalie, no. Natalie, no. So we're going to be on the jet. <laughs> you hungry and broken and beat out and done has no benefit to me. None. So I leave it as that. I have been talking, you know, it's it, Andrew, when you have people that have been on your journey with you since you're 13 years old or 14, that is Natalie. I've been mm -hmm. talking about this jet oh, for yes. years. Oh, yes. For years. And I always say skinny music will be playing. And I said, the, listen, man, it's the pilot. Oh, 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 oh. And we talk about it. Natalie, please make a comment. We talk about this jet. Georgia talk about this jet. We co-create that dream of the jet and the experience. Absolutely. This jet thing has been going on for a while, Andrew. So thank you. Go. And yes, okay. you can get a ride on my jet. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Andrew, I am old enough to know to when I need the spirit to just flow and the energy to flow. So yeah. say what you want. And Thank you. Do what comes in your spirit. So let's talk about children. And I have a question about children in a different way. Yes. What do you want to give your kids that you never had when you were growing up? I want to give them self-esteem. Mm. Self-esteem. I had self-esteem. I was a little proud little boy. Mm. I want to give them the lesson about loving themselves. You know, I come back to that a lot, Nakia, because... So many times, a lot of kids think they, are not, they don't deserve. Mm. And growing up, I don't think, I think, I thought I deserve a lot of stuff. You know, I didn't grow up in a family, in a house where, where parents dream bigger. My mom was amazing and she's still amazing. But growing up in church, humility was the key of the day. And so humility means just satisfy. Yeah. Sometimes I ask my mom if she ever had bigger dreams. Yeah. But I guess the dreams was to give us the best, which she did, that she had. But I think if I had, if I had kids now, I would tell them, let, let's say I have a child now. And because I always thought I was going to have girl kids. And she running to me and she said, Daddy, I want to be a ballerina. I would turn to her and I said, Oh, you, you better. You're going to be a ballerina. Oh, I would show her all the videos about the best ballerina. I would mm. the ballet. I would show her a picture on TV. I'd let her pick up pictures of ballerina on the stage and put it on her wall. I would allow her to dream and I would fuel her dream and her self-love and her self-esteem. 
that's what I would do. If I had kids now, whatever they want to be, I would say to them, yes, yes. Daddy, I want to be a designer. I buy you your first sewing machine. You know, that's what you do. You want them to be, so you, you tell them that they can be a lot, not just be simple, but they can be amazing. Yes. Yes. That's what I would do. That's what I want to give to my children if I had children. I'm too old for kids now. <laughs> All right. So I have one more question um, that I have. And then we're going to move to the questions that people have submitted. So the questions yes. that people have submitted is on my homepage, Nakia Salmon, and it's that purple poster. I think that's the last purple poster that I had of this um, live. And I have one, two, three, four, five questions. And I think we have okay, We're going to go quick through with them. those. Yes, right, we we're going to go quick. quick. Um, but talk about lessons learned. What is the biggest lesson you learned in the last six months? Wow. In the last six months? The real meaning of brave and courageous. Mm. I have always considered myself to be brave and I've lived a brave life. But in the last six months, Black Lives Matter doing the work that I do. Yeah. In the space that I work in. Yeah. I know what it, I think it has finally come home to me what it means to be brave, mm. courageous. I have gotten a lot of opportunities lately. And some of those opportunities have asked me to be less than me or have asked me to water down my message or have asked me to make it palatable so it could be consumed by a white audience or whatever. And in every single thing, I have had to be brave. I have had courageous conversations. I remember the first time in my life I walk away from a check. An opportunity happened in June I was being offered a, a, speaking, a speaking gig. It was worth, I told the, the organization what it was worth and they came back to me and they asked for a discount and, and these are people that make millions. And yeah. I told them and I said in a very brave letter that I've never written before, I said, it is, you know, at this time you shouldn't be discounting black labor. And the big, big CEO was offended and I let it go. I said, well, let's find somebody else. And I walked away for the first time. I walk away from money. And I thought to myself, could I do that? But I realized that I had to because it was more than the check and the money. It was, it was, it was against every single thing. In the middle of George Floyd and people wanting workshop, there was an organization of a bunch of white people asking me to pay me less to talk about racism. And I know these people would pay thousands to their white, com um, white companions to do other workshops. And I said, no. And I let it go. And I tell you, I felt so proud of myself. I want to take myself to ice cream. But we, I want to take myself to buy ice cream. I was so proud of myself. Because I realized for the first time, not every money is good money. Yes. And that every opportunity is an opportunity. Yes. Sometimes when nobody's watching us, we have to be brave. I didn't sell blackness short. I didn't cash in on a black gig in, and, didn't, and didn't do it right. And I was so proud of myself. But I'm going to tell you all the story end because I have to tell you the end of the story. Tell me. I month pass. Huh. So they close the deal. Bye bye. Whatever, whatever. I month, I think about three or so weeks pass. And I got an email. Hmm. Yes, dear Dr. Campbell, we have want to revisit our conversation. We'd like you to be the speaker. And they paid me the exact money I asked for. Wow. That for me was, was something else. It was not just about the check, not about the opportunity, about the money. It was about me standing strong in the face of an opportunity and negotiating what is good for me. And Nikki, Nikki, I think you need to make sure you know that because people mm. have all kind of offers and not every offer is an offer. Mm. So you have to be smart about that and stand in who you are. I guarantee people, you know, people have, uh, people have said to me many times, and, and let me just say this, I'm going to say this, Nakia, mm. and it's not advice, but people have tried to tell me how to do my spoonful or how to do certain things. And it's not bad advice. They get, you I know understand. The trick is you have to be careful how people come in at the end and try to steer your vision. 
It's, mm. it's your vision. You have to know what is it that you want and how you want it. And so I have, I've had to be way braver. I have had to say things in workshops and know I stand in that mm. and they may not invite me back to speak because it's too strong for them. But I've also been in spaces where it's so strong and when I'm finished, people said, I want more. <clears throat> so you have to learn you're not for everyone. And I think a lot of us, we are damaged because we want to be loved by everyone. As much as I know you love me, Nakia, let me tell you, I am no fool. Everybody does not love Andrew or Dr. ABC. And it's okay because if everybody loves you, something is wrong. Yes. But you must, that's a part of it. That's it. Anytime you touch on anything that relates to value, my spirit, probably because my spirit is open to that topic, yeah, and open yeah, to that discussion, yeah. and probably yeah. because in full transparency, you know, and the people who are on this live that knows me, I love to ask the questions. Yeah. <laughs> right? This is my, I love it. This is where I want to be. Mm -hmm. But Andrew, I struggle with value. It's an ongoing struggle. And as you walk that story, I had to say, would I be in that place to make that bold call? Because right now, and I'm sure there's other people on the live that has talents and do work and they struggle to give somebody a price. Yeah. Right? And let's talk real talk. Let's talk real oh, talk. Real ta and real I'm talk. trying not to cry because we can't cry real with makeup talk. because makeup stink. stink. Real talk. Real talk. Real talk. I struggle with giving people a price. Because you know what? We're not taught our value. Let me just say this. People, let me, let me share something very personal with you. Go ahead. People have given me so many tips about workshops and people want that. But, but what you find out is that there's no manual about what you are worth. You have to define your worth. And the defining worth doesn't mean by yourself. That's superficial. Understand. Like, for instance, the speaking fee that I asked for at that occasion wasn't superficial. I have spoken for that and more than that. So what I asked for was a regular price. Right. Regular price. But someone thought I did not work that. Right. I want you to get it. What I asked for in Ikea was regular price. I didn't ask for more. You have to know what your value is and what you're asking for. I didn't ask some more. I didn't ask some more. I asked for what I know I'm worth. I'm qualified. I am doing this thing. But what I was offered was less than I know what my value is. And let us be very frank about this, Nakia. And let's use an analogy. When I just started speaking, I remember asking people, what did you charge for this? So I listened to people's price. I listened. And you know. But when you come to, and this is going to be for you, when you come to a place where you know what you are worth, yeah. you can't allow people to give you less. You can't allow people to give you less. So we're not going to know we are, we are worth in every single thing. I don't know what, I, I don't know what, I don't know what um, a, math, a math genius is worth. I'm not a math genius. I don't know what a, 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 an exotic dancer is worth for an hour. I'm not an exotic dancer. I don't know. I don't know what you know an accountant is work if he comes to my house to do my books. I don't. If I'm supposed to get, when well, if I'm supposed to blow up, so to speak, and I want a private accountant, I don't know what a private accountant is worth per hour. I don't know. I have to ask friends or accountant what is what would what would a private accountant be for an hour, and they will tell me. But I know what I'm worth for this. I know what I'm worth for this. And so that person, literally in the first line of the sentence, ask for a discount. So they discounted my value, they discounted my, uh, what, what I brought to the table. And let me just say, I give discounts all the time to those who need a discount. Those who need a discount. Those who need a discount. You are not gonna try to capitalize and trick me with capitalism. You're gonna pay me what I'm worth. So that is it. Um. So guys, our goal is to be an hour today. We're going to do our best to stick to it. Um, so I have questions from the audience that people pre-submitted. And I was a teacher. I like people who show up early and submit their questions. Okay. <laughs> 
So I'm going to give honor. I am going to uh, give appreciation for people who sent in their questions early. And we're going to do our best to try to get to those questions. If you have uh -huh. other questions for Andrew, please leave it in the chat. And he can always go back and answer you after the session. Right, Andrew? Absolutely. Yes. Just to be respectful of people's time is Monday night and we have kids. Yes. And let, uh, I'm gonna go quick. let me go quick. All right. We have you go quick. All right. So question is from Sharika Richardson. How do you manage to always stay so positive with everything going on around you? That personality is for to die for as a Jamaican. People love to say we should could rub our family. Much love. <sighs> How would I say positive? I'm thankful for little things. I'm thankful yeah. for little things. I'm thankful for little things. So yeah. I'm going back to that first thing I talk about dreaming big. Remember I said that? But mm -hmm. I also said while I'm while you're enjoying something, you enjoy. So for me, my positive is I always thankful for everything. So let's say, let's say I applied for a couple of classes to teach, because I, I teach as an adjunct and I don't get all the classes I want. I am always thankful for the classes that I do get. You know, I want to go to a hotel and it's too much money a night and it's too expensive. I'm just thankful that I can go to another hotel that is cheaper and I have a blast, just the same. So I do use that old church song. Yeah. You know, all of my good days have outweigh my bad days and I won't complain. And it's not that I don't have things to complain about, but I don't invest in that because sometimes I think we, we miss the, the beautiful moment because we are so... We're so complaining about other things. Yeah. You know, you know, when I when 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 I when I finished my CXC, back to that story, and I failed, I failed two of my CXC at that time. I I was happy that four that I passed. I was happy I passed four. And immediately I start the work on the two and I passed them. I passed them the next year in no time. So that is it. We have to, the positive comes from thinking about, yes, you want more, but always be thankful for what you have. Yeah. And I tell people all the while, I am not thankful not because I have a little bit more than enough now. I have been thankful when I had less than enough. I've always been a thankful person. You give me a glass of wine, I am thankful. You give me some lemonade once in a clean cup, thankful. Because I'm not going to, I'm not going to drink lemonade from your dirty cup. <laughs> so, yes. So I am good with lemonade. I am good with a glass of wine. I'm good with both. So attitude of gratitude in all circumstances. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. I'm so all right. thankful. All right. Next question from Claudia Lyrely. What stereotypes have you had to deal with as a Jamaican educator and diversity advocate while living overseas? Wow. That's a big... Look here. Look here. My, see my people, them come good. <laughs> Ster <laughs> stere stere stereotypes. Yeah. Is when some of the stereotypes you have to deal with is people expect certain things from you because you're Jamaican. Yeah. So you know, you know, they expect and and they're and they're always negative, right? Yeah. They expect you to to they, they expect you to smoke. They expect you to like dance out as your favorite music. They expect a lot of things that is very stereotypical, right? Especially living in North America, they expect you to 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 you know you go to Jamaica, man. You bring back any party, I'll be like, party is the least. You know, but is the least. But sometimes, I, sometimes I, in their defense, I understand that their their limit, their cultural awareness is limited. And that's why when I do, she asked about equity. When I do equity workshops, mm -hmm. I tell people they need to grow in cultural competence. People need to be more exposed than the box you live in. Yeah. Be more exposed than your stuff. You need to open up yourself to see. It's a big world out there, you know. It's a really big world. It's a really big world and we need to open ourselves. And so that's some of the stereotypes, you know, the, the usual Jamaican stereotypes, you know, I, I've had to deal with. So this one comes from Ornette Storer Hines. Your bio states that you have been an educator for over 25 years in different countries. I commend you. In which country would you say you were able to be the most inspirational and be your own self? I know people in Jamaica are going to be upset. But I'm going to tell you something. I think teaching in the Bahamas at St. John's College. I spent four years at a school, St. John's College. It was just perfect. 
I was given the space to just be. And I, I stretched. I grew being those four years at St. John's were some of my favorite years. Four years at St. John's College. Was, and then second runner-up, because you know I like a good pageant. Second runner-up would be the one year at Lanamans Prep where I was the head of department for the kindergarten, for the lower school. So that yeah. was kindergarten and grade one. I was in charge of the lower school of Lanamans Prep for one year, 1999 to 2000. One of my best year, one of my best year teaching. I gave my heart to that school yeah. and the school gave, the, and the school gave me back that, their heart. I was treated well with respect. The parents loved me. I love the parents, the teachers and the staff. We got along well. They loved me. We did magic for that one year. Magic at Lanaman's Prep. So I love teaching. 25 years. I can't tell. I cannot tell at all. <laughs> for people who don't know, 25 years as a trained teacher. So I'm not as young as I look. It's good genes, good God. And, I, I and water, up. and water. <laughs> and I drink water and I mind my own business. <laughs> I leave people business alone, okay? Because I have business to mine. <laughs> the next question is from our mutual friend Stafford. I never mm. hear him the corniest person in know. You know, Stafford is always <laughs> troublemaker. Stafford is a troublemaker. What? What Stafford? What Stafford? Stafford compare and look here. He actually comes serious this time. Compare and contrast, if applicable, teaching styles that you had to use in Jamaica, the Baham, the Bahamas, and Canada. Compare and contrast. Compare and contrast. I've always been a creative teacher. Mm. Always use one skill. My favorite tool to use through all my career is love other people's children. I think the kids who I've taught and adults too, they know they, I, they know I care. Yeah. They know I care. I have enough emails from adults and parents to know that they know I care. I, that's my ingredient, Stafford. I care for people's children. As to the contrast is Jamaica, I had to be far more creative than Canada. Because in Canada, you have so much things to your comfort. Like you just go to the store and buy every single chart you want. Like I, when I used to go to teach a store, they, I mean, and it's getting even better. There's a chart for every, or a poster, they call it poster now, right? But back home in Jamaica, I had to create those things. I think things are changing now. Even Jamaica, they are the fancy ones. But I might, when I was a younger teacher, I had to be a little bit more creative than now. Um, now, there's some, everything is ready-made for you. Everything comes in a kit. You know, you have a kit. Yeah. The next thing is also is the level of discipline. So in Jamaica and the Bahamas, you could punish different from in, in North America, right? You can't, yes. you can't really punish kids at all. You punish them back home. And the truth is, I don't want to punish kids anymore like that. Yes. If one I should go back home to Jamaica to teach, I would never punish kids like I did years ago because yeah. I, there's, a, there's a different way to do it. It takes more work, let's be frank. Yes. More to work, it takes more talk and it takes more communication. But yeah, I would treat my kids back home the same way I treat these people's children here in, in, in North America. Yeah. We have a couple of teachers on the line, just so you know including yes. Jody. And the last yes. question we have is from Dr. Christine Thomas Bell, a fellow educator. And mm -hmm. she does also um, education is for special needs. Um, and I have a special needs son. I don't know if you know my third yeah. born. Yeah. So her question is, last question from our audience is teachers are all over the country have been stressed, overworked, underpaid, and underappreciated. We have seen the exit of many teachers into early retirement and transitioning to their careers. Um, how do you motivate the future teachers that you educate to be their best in, in a crumbling world in the classroom and to continue to pursue their passion? Somebody has to hold the light. Tell us more. Somebody has to hold the light. Somebody has to hold the light, you know? I do a lot of work in equity. Mm. When I go into workshop, I go in hard. And I do the call out and I do that. But if you've ever been in my workshop, you'll realize when I'm leaving you, whether you're black, white, whatever you are, I leave you in hope. 
I live in you trusting you to do better. I live in you that tomorrow you're going to be a better person. You're going to be more inclusive. You're going to see me more. You're going to treat people's children right. You're going to be less divisive, less marginalizing, less stereotyping. I leave you in hope. I and all our children, they need hope. Let me just say this to you. There are kids right now who are suffering all over the world. Yeah. Not because, they're, not because they can't do maths. Not because they can't do science. Not because the school doesn't have enough computer and laptops but because they don't feel like they belong. They don't want to go to school because they don't like, nobody likes them. They are treated well. People will do a lot if they know you believe in them and you, and you love them. We, somebody needs to tell our kids they can. Somebody needs to tell that little girl, you are beautiful. Somebody needs to tell a little boy, you are handsome. Somebody needs to tell that little, when that, to say, a little girl said, I want to be a nurse. Said, oh, absolutely, you're going to be a nurse. They need that. They need someone to hold the light. And we live, in a, we live in a world that seems to be getting dark and dark and darker. And so we need somebody to hold the light. I can tell you, there are people who are very critical. I said this to you, Nakia, as an encouragement. There are people who are very cynical and critical about programs like these. Yeah. I remember when I published my book, someone who I thought would have supported me more said, do you think they need another self-help book? Mm. And why I know that person meant it, because years after, I saw that person heavily criticize someone else who published a self-help book. Mm. And it, it took me six years to know what I felt was real, because I felt something, and I only told my two best friends about it. I said I felt a negative energy, but I, but I let it go. It took me five years, and I saw that person make a post on somebody else's page about a self-help book, and I go... No, I get it. What I felt five years ago was real. But I'm going to say this to you, Nakia. There are tons of story like this and tons of show like this. And many persons say, do we need another show like this, another talk show, another encouragement, another whatever? And I say to you, yes, we do. I say, yes, we do. I'm going to tell you why we do, Nakia. Because we have enough people out there who are hurting, who are making bad decisions, who are, who are depressed, who are going to the bottle, drinking themselves to sleep, crying themselves to sleep, ready to jump. That we have enough people who are, who are hurting. We have enough people who are in darkness. If your job is to bring the light, like my spoonful something is to bring the light, I'm gonna bring the light. And I'm not looking at the crowd, I'm looking at the people. And I can tell you, every time something says to me, you know, maybe not stop, do whatever, whatever, I get an inbox email from a stranger. It's always from a stranger. It's never from somebody down the street. It's mm. always they said, I listen to your thing. I saw you on this. I saw somebody page. Thank you so much. I have had tears. I have had tears. I have had tears. I have had that all the time. So let me just say this. If my life, I'm going to finish with this. You know, I'm going to go to church, girl. I have to go to church. That's my church boy. I have to, I'm a church boy. The, I'm a Jesus boy. <laughs> that people don't know, but I'm a Jesus boy. Yeah. And he says, if I could help somebody as I travel along, if I could cheer somebody with a word, come on now, or a song, then my living shall not be in vain. And I feel pretty cute. And I feel pretty, pretty. <laughs> Somebody says to me, I am feeling better today because what you said to me. I've done it. I'm rich. Oh, I, I'm rich. You see, richness is not just in money. And I'm not trying to be cute. Yeah. I am rich in so many things. And I'm rich in the fact that people trust me to yeah. share. I hold that so deep when people trust me to say to me, Andrew, I'm hurting or something. I hold that so close that this boy with this mouth who talks so loud and talks so much, people trust me and know you will not be hurt by my mouth. Mm. So yeah, we need a light. 
So the light. young teachers out there, all of you want to go to teachers college, we need light. Somebody we, has to hold the light. So you're saying teachers are, light light. teachers are light bearers. They're light bearers. They are light bearers. Absolutely. It's been amazing. I wish I could see the people on Facebook what they're saying, but I can't see them. Yes. Yes. I have to, I listen, I go and I'm trying to look, but I am like so immersed in your energy. Listen, I know. Your, your you. energy is freaking intoxicating. I must have saying, mocked. They're saying to... all the good things on your page because right now I know it's I've been consistent over 40 something person. I've been very consistent. And yeah. And things, but I say it on your place. I'll see it later on. All right, all right. I am glad. So, if you have other questions that you'd like Dr. A, B, C to answer, just leave a comment and he'll find it when he goes through the comments. But let me tell you, Mother Teacher and me, I'm always going to make sure the early student, the early bird, get the most worm that we'll prioritize their questions first. So, when I have other courageous conversations and I said, What questions do you have for the guests? Ask it quick. Ask your question. So I listen to a lot of people. I immerse myself in people's stories. I've been doing this for the past five years. And one of the sections that I love is Fast Five. I kind of modify it and Nakia eyes what I want, but the concept okay. is pretty similar. It is adopted from other people that I listen to. Of course. All right. So we're ready for the Fast Five and this is how we're going to wrap and this is how we're going to close. Okay. First one. Tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. I am most proud of? My heart. Yes, I'll give me a little bit more. Tell me more. I'm most proud of my heart. My heart. My heart is my heart is full. It's full yeah. of thankfulness. It's full of love. It's full of thankfulness. It's full of kindness. My I'm proud of my heart. My heart is forgiving. My heart. I, I'm proud of my heart. I'm proud of my heart. I am most grateful for the amazing people in my life. The amazing people. I have. I have amazing people in my life. I have good family members that love me to death. The ones who do love me, love me to death. And, <laughs> and I have friends that I've been friends. I have the same friends from when I was 12 and 13. Solid friends like what you have. Solid. When I say solid, I mean solid. Not every once in 10 years. I'm talking about solid friends. Yeah, man. I know. I know those friends. Next one, number three. I wish everyone knew. I wish everyone knew. <laughs> oh, I don't even know what the answer for that. Fast five. I wish everyone knew they could be they could be somebody. Yes. I wish everybody knew they could be somebody. I wish everybody knew that. I wish I could change. I wish I could change people who don't love themselves. Mm. I really wish I could change people who don't love themselves. Because I think if they, if they ever love themselves, they would be just better persons. And we have a lot of people who don't love themselves. They are hurting. And I wish I could just teach them how to love themselves. Because with that is powerful. And it's not about yourself. It's not selfish. It's about loving yourself so you can love others. People who don't love themselves can't love anybody else, honey. No. Nope. Last one. I never want to lose myself. I never want to lose myself. I never want to lose myself. No. Never want to lose myself. It's, it's a journey. You, you start by saying, a journey? My life has been a journey. I never want to lose myself. My humor, my loud mouth, my extraness, my patience, my kindness, the way I treat people. I don't want to lose myself. We don't want to lose you either. Thank you. <laughs> Before I close, is there anything else that was in your heart, is in your heart that you wanted to share with the audience before we close? No, I think I shared. I shared what was there tonight to be shared. I shared it. I, I left. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't rob you. Just so you know, persons who are listening, I did not rob you. I gave you exactly what I brought and even a little bit more. So thank you so much for having me. I am a part of your history. Now I'm part of this program. And I leave you 
saying, continue to do what you do. Continue sowing the seed, continue watering it, continue with your level of professionalism that you have. I admire that. I admire, a lot of people are doing certain work and they're not putting the professionalism that it, it, it needs. And I'm saying this publicly, you have been so organized with this. I can't imagine when you have a talk show on a TV and there's gonna be tons of people, how organized it's gonna be because you, are, you, have this, you, have this, you have the skill set that is necessary to build on. And so continue. I receive that in my spirit with everything I have. Mm -hmm. I want to say thank you for taking this step with me. I will never forget it. It is not easy to start something new. It is quite frankly batshit scary. Yes, and I want to yes. say thank you for saying yes when I reached out months ago and said, I have this idea. Are you with me? And you said, no. First you said, what is your intention? Let me be yes. very clear. Yes. You're like, why? What is your intention, Nakia? And I was ready. You should know better. And <laughs> I told you my intention very clearly and my desire for why I wanted to do this program. And I told you why I wanted you to, be. to take this step with me. So thank you yeah. for saying yes. And there's other people on the line that have said yes to all my other projects. Let me tell you, man, my dream so big, my teeth they knock. Nice. And I want to tell you, thank you whenever you say yes to me. Not just you, Andrew, but anyone else mm -hmm. on the call who has said yes to my projects. My vision yeah. is big. My dream is big. And I will have space on the jet. With yes. that, I'm going to close this first episode of Courageous Conversations. Please join us whenever I pull in another person who's bravely daring to live their best life and to pursue their dreams with everything they got with every last breath. Have a good Monday night. Hug your family for me and just have a blessed week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.